So hello and welcome to this, the next instalment of Everyday People Living Inspirational Lives. And today I am truly, I, I use the word blessed a lot um, when I introduce people, but today I genuinely mean it. It's quite interesting that I'm actually interviewing someone that I've known in my life probably for about six or seven years. But actually, I hadn't ever considered necessarily interviewing Mark, and it was one of my previous guests that have went, there's this man that you should, inter- that you should interview, and suddenly, lo and behold, actually, you discover these amazingly powerful things um, that people in your life, you didn't necessarily appreciate they did. So, Mark, hello and welcome. Good morning. Well, nice to have the opportunity to join you. Cool. Thank you very much indeed. So I'm just going to take a moment and just let everyone know that that right now um, I'm talking with Mark Hannaford, um, who uh, I would title as an adventurer. I'm not quite sure. How do you title yourself, Mark? Do you still use the category of adventurer? Yeah, I pretty much. That's I would. I'm due to, but I'm not due to. I'm due to fly to Greenland on Friday. That's all in the bin. <laughs> but I, I'm still driven by that by that desire. Cool. Uh, and so the bit that I didn't necessarily know about, so I, I know Mark as the managing director of um, uh, of a really successful events company, but actually the bit that, that where Mark makes a huge, even bigger difference in the world is as the chief executive of um, World Extreme Medicine and actually all the things that, you know, that, that he's involved in and, and sponsors and, and has had the title of honorary professor bestowed upon him in, in recent years as a reflection of the contribution that he's made in to that extreme medicine community. So have I done you justice there, Mark, or how would you describe yourself? I think you've pretty much done me justice there. I have to say the, the, uh, the title honorary professor, which is absolutely amazing, I'm sure would have given my junior school and the secondary school teachers heart attacks. But yeah, Exeter University bestowed, bestowed that sort of honour on me and I'm, and I'm um, very grateful to them for doing so. Cool. And, and, and actually something that doesn't really occur for many people. So I, so I think um, uh, I think probably people kind of need to understand probably the scale of the contribution that you've made for, to even have it considered to be an honorary professor, let alone actually have the have the title bestowed upon you well it's been we've um essentially been really active in the in the development of something called extreme medicine which is you know in its simplest form taking medicine taking it into uh some of the world's most remote and at times dangerous locations and improving that field so medicine in the field <coughs> medicine and expeditions medicine in sudden onset disasters humanity said is better than it's ever been and we've kind of coalesced it into uh into a medical subdiscipline cool and so what actually you know your journey how has your journey through you know through life through adventuring through you know how has it brought you to this point then that that this has become the thing that you're passionate about well, I think adventuring is the is the key word because I would have always wanted to uh, undertake adventures, even since I was a young child. It was always the thing that drove me, wanting to go to those foreign places and you know trek across Australia and all that sort of those sort of um, those concepts of going away. So I set up um, and started work as an expedition leader. Um, and about sort of 20, 25 years ago, or 26 years ago, we set up across the divide um, to, to run, run our own expedition. Now, I think um, as a professional expedition leader, I was really conscious of the fact that I was taking people away out of their comfort zone into places which were really remote and low resource. Um, and I was really conscious that we had a moral responsibility to not only bring them back, but also to bring them back with all their, all their bits still attached. Um, and I wanted to have proper, robust, and secure medical backup so that w- when stuff does go wrong, because ine- inevitably accidents happen and inevitably, you know, things go wrong, um, that the medics that were with us were uh, as best as they possibly could be. Um, and we initially started working with a group of friends who were sort of emergency medicine doctors um, and we became quite successful and that quickly then became friends of friends. And as we, as we sort of started introducing a sort of wider cohort, we realized actually whilst amazing medics and, and that kind of group has morphed to extend to sort of nurses and paramedics. Now 
you know, whilst amazing medics are very used to working within a hospital environment where they have machines, they have uh, people they can ask for advice, they have power, they have a roof, everything's, you know, um, secure. So we needed to provide them with training to work in an environment where all that equipment was largely stripped away. Most often as not, there was nobody there to help them. They were the sole provider and there was certainly no roof and there was certainly no power. Um, and that for a lot of medics is quite a big leap. And we needed one to teach them the skills to do that, but also to give them the confidence to operate as a sole provider in those environments. Um, and also to give them the ability to deal with the stress and the strain that comes along with that. Because as a human factors element, not so much working on our, our expeditions, but if you imagine you're a, a medic working for Médecins Sans Frontières, where you're actually maybe on the edge of a war zone or in a war zone, um, with under lots of pressure there's a big human factors impact in terms of doing that type of work um so we, as i said we set up our own tra internal training courses which by um by consensus from our team became a, then a publicly accessible course we did our first course about 18 years ago in the lake district um and we were amazed because 70 doctors turned up we had an absolute blast and, you know, and really loved working with that cohort of people. And also it was sustainable. We could do other courses and knew that this was something that people wanted and was going to add positively to these, to, to medicine. And I guess we've come quite a long way from that initial course in so much as we now run a, a master's program in extreme medicine with Exeter University. You know, we contribute to the uh, space and aviation short module at the University of Texas Medical Board in Houston, um, which is closely linked with partners at NASA. Um, we run courses all over the world. Um, we've got a, you know, a digital presence in terms of having an online learning academy because what we found was doctors and medics, nurses, paramedics were joining us from these from different disciplines such as aviation medicine, military medicine, humanitarian medicine and expedition medicine. We found that there were very similar types of people in so much as they wanted some adventure in their life. They were generally pretty good team players um, and that they wanted to use their medical training in a positive way. But they were, at the time, isolated, and we wanted to build a community where those silos were broken down so that not only were opportunities shared, but also knowledge and experience was shared. And now, increasingly, new research is shared across those platforms so that it isn't isolated in military medicine and it isn't isolated in expedition or humanity medicine. There's a meeting point for that knowledge where, where, the, where there's a great synergy. Um, and it's... A pretty, you know, we're dealing with an incredible group of people who have have the ability to make an amazing impact on the world around them, um, and it's amazing, and it's it's re really rewarding from my side to see that community beginning to flourish and grow, and the aims that we set out to achieve being achieved in terms of new research being shared across, new research being generated, um, but also opportunities being shared and and networks being built as a result. Cool. It just sounds quite, quite, quite incredible. So, um, is it is it currently the the is it beyond the vision that you you know that you thought you'd have? Is it is the vision for it just evolving every day as as as, as new opportunities present themselves within that? I think you're right. I think it's um, it's a bit of an endless vision because it's it's uh, as medicine and the world are constantly changing. So it's. It's more rewarding than I thought it would ever be because what we're doing is producing real social benefit. Um, is have we achieved our vision? No, I think our vision is endless. You know, and at some point, um, you know, um, our others at some point will stop will stop working. And I want to create a legacy that I would hope that somebody else would then pick up and take even further. Cool. Um. So, what drives you then, Mark? What inspires you? It's an interesting one. I'm what drives me is building networks and making uh making a difference i guess um what inspires me i still absolutely love to travel um but it's building networks that create social change in a sort of financially state um sustainable way um it's you know it's an amazing the, conf the we, we run the world's largest conference in extreme medicine. It's called the World Extreme Medicine, and that happens every year. Perhaps not this year. We haven't quite decided on that. But what's amazing about that audience 
Um, and about that stage is you, we get the ability because we strip away generally people's titles. We've got you know, a huge number of professors there, a huge number of doctors there, a huge number of paramedics, but everybody is referred to by their first name. So there's no sort of hierarchical sort of barriers to networking. Everybody's there to do the same thing. That's to share knowledge. But it's a stage where organizations like Médecins Sans Frontières can sit on the same stage as a, um, a special forces medic who's on the same stage as, um, you know, a space surgeon from NASA, because nobody's got titles and everybody's there for one reason, is to make medicine in remote areas better. And I think that, for me, sort of sums up what I get out of the job, is, is breaking down those barriers, breaking down those, that kind of institutional inertia that sometimes surrounds medicine um, and allows that sort of growth of medicine in, in and serves people in low resource environments, you know, when they've been injured, when they've been um, subject to a sudden onset disaster like a hurricane or an earthquake. You know, the, 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 the quality of medicine being delivered is getting slowly but incrementally better as a result of what, what lots of other people are doing, but also the small part that we're playing in that sort of um, development. But importantly for us, we're producing medics or medics are able to engage with a side of medicine and go away on expeditions and go away and do deployments. You know, they're learning um, resilience themselves. They're learning how to team build. They're learning how to leadership skills. They're learning how personal resilience in terms of working stressful environments. The benefits of the system that they do work in, whilst we, the, the NHS and the system here is much maligned, actually in comparison to lots of other systems in the world it's an amazing system and i think there is an appreciation of that so one of the the big aims is for us is to expose clinicians and medics to this world of medicine but then return them to everyday medicine actually better medics because they're more empathetic they're better team players they've learned leadership they're used to working and problem solving they're used to working in local resource environments and then consequently they've learned good problem solving skills as well Cool. So, um, so you, you you clearly become very animated as you talk about that. So it's something that um, uh, clearly that, that you're very passionate about. So, so how do you feel it? How do you know? Is it the big things or is it the little things? What are those moments when you just feel as though, do you know what? That is inspirational. I really connect with that moment. That's why I do what I do. I think it's a it's a mixture, and I think that's probably the. Probably the same for most people. I don't know. I mean, you probably know that better than I. But I think it is, it's a mixture of the small stuff and the big stuff. I mean, last week I got the opportunity to interview the director of medicine for NASA. And because of, because of technical difficulties, he actually gave us three hours of our time, his time, which and I kind of sat there thinking, wow, this is one amazingly generous of this individual, J.D. Polk. Uh, and a reflection of him, but also we're in a, at a position where um, they deem that time worthwhile. That was an amazing experience. But equally, it's the messages we get back um, after people attending sessions where you know they're, they're, they, they know that they want to do this type of medicine, but they just don't know how. And we provide that pathway and the signposting and to get messages of the back saying, you know, this is being trans transformative in, in my outlook. You know, those are really important. And actually, oddly enough, because of COVID, we've done, been doing a lot more digital content. And I've had a lot more time to talk to some of the faculty that, that work with us. And the number of times of which, and these are sort of London uh, Air Ambulance consultants. They are really senior humanitarian medics. They are really, see, um, you know, people going off. And the number of times people said have said, rather, that the reason they are doing what they've done is because they attended a conference or a course, they met somebody through us, because it's enabled what they wanted to do, and it's given them the signpost. Um, and that's been really rewarding as well, and actually taken me a little bit by surprise, that actually the impacts. Well, I interviewed, uh, interviewed a guy called Mike Christian, who's a, a doctor for London Hems, and really been at the forefront of the fight against COVID in terms of the, the London Air Ambulance response. And he is, in, in, a, is in, a, in London Air Ambulance as a result of coming to one of our workshops and sitting next to um, one of the, the patients who benefited from London Air Ambulance, who then 
later got up and spoke. He was so inspired by one meeting that person, but also being shown the avenue he could follow, that he emigrated from Canada, moved to London to become a to become a doctor with London Air Ambulance. So stories like that that really quite, you know, make it worthwhile. So do do you yourself seek to be inspirational then? Because clearly, what you do and what you've achieved is is inspiring people to go on and do you know incredibly great things. So is it something that you set out to do? Is it something you focus on? No, I'm not sure that I do. For me, it's about following a passion and following um, uh, something that fascinates me. So I'm not sure. So there's certainly no desire or um, inclination to be inspirational. I'm, I'm not sure I'd call myself that either. But it's just following a passion which um, people... It, which is worthwhile and people are engaging with and it's building that community and that I, mean, I think that it's that community of people with whom we engage actually from whom we also draw our own energy as well so how do you how do you define your sense of community how do you know it exists how do you know that actually it's it's working well I think probably because it takes me about two hours in the morning to do emails and respond to messages. Um, and a lot of them are, how can I, or I really like that, what should I do next type of questions. And that for me is um, part of our, not our not our remit, but as our raison d'etre. It's kind of, you know, we're running a business, so we have to run conferences and courses, and we have to make it financially stable, uh, financially sustainable. But it's really important for me and actually for the rest of the team that we create a legacy by helping the next generation of, of medics, be they, you know, paramedics, nurses, doctors, but also, you know, on our books, uh, engaging with us, our midwives and physiotherapists, you know, because when people respond to sudden on onset disasters, you know, I think the, the headlines grab the, you know, the surgical tent set up doing operations. But actually, everybody's got their normal ailments. Everybody's got their, everybody, there are people who are pregnant and need to have babies delivered. There are people who have their normal primary care problems like diabetes, heart stroke, you know, and there are lots of physical injuries that need physiotherapists. Um, so lots of those people who traditionally, I suspect, wouldn't have thought that they necessarily had a role in that type of medicine. You know, it's making them aware that actually they have a crucial role. In fact, you know, they have a bigger role than some of the stuff that gains the headlines. So it's engagement with those types of people and sort of um, helping them on their on their journey as well. So if um uh, if there was someone listening to this who went, I love the idea of this of this sense of of creating an inspirational community. What advice and guidance would you give them? What advice and guidance would you give people about how to go about that? How do they do it? In terms of building a community or in terms of engaging in this type of medicine? Well, not so much this type of medicine, because I'll come back to that question in a moment. But actually, if, if they, uh, in whatever field they're in and they wanted to, they go, that just sounds amazing. You've got uh, a community of people who are sharing, who are supporting, who are giving. You know, how have you done it, Mark? You know, how would, how would you, what advice and guidance would you give to someone who wanted to do something similar? I think there are probably two pieces of advice. One, you have to be absolutely passionate about you what you do, because otherwise it's not sustainable. And then two, realize it's hard work. It's constant. It's constant. You know, we built our community up over over quite a long period, but it's been constant every single day. And that goes back to that passion. You have to really enjoy the topic you're talking about, otherwise that becomes monotonous and becomes repetitive. And that comes across in the way you communicate. You know, I'm still wholly passionate about what I do. And I, as a result, I think every message I send out reflects the fact that I absolutely love what I do. But I'm also, you know, here to to inspire and and show other people their, their pathway in this particular avenue that I'm in. And I think you have to have those two things, otherwise it doesn't really work. Um, so so what, what, what sort of... Uh... You know, what sort of person, what sort of medic then finds themselves naturally being drawn to to wanting to, to come and join you or to email you? Well, I think there's there's the obvious types and you're you know, I think probably your listeners will have, you know, tweaked who they might be, like your your paramedics and your nurses working in emergency rooms and similarly doctors working in emergency medicine. But actually the scope 
for uh, opportunity is far greater than that. And actually, I think there are huge swathes of the medical community who don't think they've got a role but would like to. And actually, the realization is is there is a role for virtually every type of medic um, because the, the, the expanse of extreme medicine covers that sort of disaster zone to humanitarian and expeditions to an extreme. And in all those environments, certainly when the disaster in humanitarian medicine, there is a need for for people who you would not naturally see in a humanitarian setting, like your psychiatrist, like your humanit like your physiotherapist, like your dentists, like your midwives. So it's you know part of it is is saying to is making people realise there is a role. These opportunities don't often, don't often come and hit you on the head. You have to go and seek them out. But for lots of medics, outside of that, what would seem to be the most obvious settings, the emergency room, there is huge scope for opportunity. Hmm. So, um, how, so currently, how big is the is 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 the WEM community then? Well, I guess in totality, it's about a hundred and sixty thousand people that follow us across various platforms, whether that's Facebook, Instagram, on the mailing list, and all sorts of stuff. So about 160,000. It's growing quite, it grows strongly every week. Wow. And that, that to be able to, uh, for me, as I listen to that, to be able to influence and shape a message that touches the lives of a of 160,000 people, that, that's, that's, that's incredible. I mean, I, I think there's probably even members of, of, our, of our Houses of Parliament that would love to feel as though that they had the ability to influence that, that many people. That's incredible, Mark. Um, and we find that it's quite, um, it also travels by whispers. So I will, will do something that, uh, I'll send a message out um, that, you know, seemingly doesn't have much spread. And then all of a sudden you'll get a phone call for somebody who said, I saw you, but they're not even on Facebook, but somebody's told them that this has happened or that we're, you know, we're posting about this or we've, we're releasing a new piece of research. So it is, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a huge community, but it's also quite a closely knit community. Hmm. So, um, so if if you you know, um, uh, you know you live you live in the southwest like I do. So if you if you happen to be uh, if you happen to be sat on a bench looking out to sea, and and, and a random stranger came and sat next to you, um, and they, they they kind of you know you started up you you you, you started up in conversation, and they were looking to be able to to live an inspired life. What is the Mark Hannaford formula to be so dedicated and be so passionate? What is it that you would share with them to to be able to to, to sort of follow in your footsteps? I'm not sure. I've got any particular life lessons there. I think I followed a life of passion, and that's enabled me to to get to where I've done and achieve what I've done. It's all been around passion. I think being looking outside the box and not listening necessarily to what other people expect you to do. So one of my best jobs ever was, and it was a really lovely team that I worked with, and it was a great job, was working as a graduate trainee for uh, BT, which I did for two and a half years. It was the best job ever because I absolutely, whilst I liked the people, and actually liked some of the work, absolutely hated it. And it taught me exactly what I shouldn't do. And the reason I did that scheme and that job was because I kind of thought it was expected of me you follow you're given these careers paths when you leave school and this conformist way that you have to go and I've you know did expedition leading and it wasn't you know I kind of thought I need to do a proper job now when I did my proper job and I couldn't I couldn't stand it and it gave me the um and I got stuck in a traffic jam we in, a, in my company car which had a sky roof sunroof rather and all, I had all the windows open and I was driving out of London where I lived at the time to go to the Brecon Beacons to go and we used to do that every single weekend because we wanted to get out and get into the mountains and it made me realise why am I trying to get out I should be in the Brecon Beacons or I should be in South Devon or I should be where you know back home where I come from um, and during that uh, that traffic jam I rang a company who'd offered me a job driving a rib driving a, um, a boat um, off a expedition ship in Kamchatka in the Russian Far East. And I turned it down because it was only like a, a month contract. And I was giving up this well-paid uh, job, um, and it was all a little bit unknown. And that, at that time, I didn't drive boats particularly well, which I hadn't told them. Um, and I took the job. And then a month later, I was on a plane flying to uh, 
to Japan to pick up the ship to then go out to Vladivostok and Petropavlovsk and Kamchatka and spend a month. Uh, and that one moment and that juncture of time, I just said, OK, screw this. I've got to live the life that I want to try and lead, regardless of the consequences or the barriers that I put in my own in the way of my own transition that I just need to say yes and go and do it. So it's, um, you know, often the biggest fear is the fear of the unknown. And actually, once you embark on that journey, then all those fears start to disappear as everything becomes normalised. We have um, uh, what I love about that story, Mark, is um, we, there's a little phrase that uh, that I use all of the time. And for those people that have ever spent any time on a course with me or what have you, then they'll hear me say it is, is that, that ultimately to be able to to find true happiness, you've got to do whatever it is that makes your heart sing. And and just watching you and listening to you share that story, then then that's definitely, you know, almost what I feel is a classic example of just how you connect with something that truly makes your heart sing. I think you're right. And I think, um, you know, I would encourage everybody to do that. It is. I mean, it's not without risk and it's certainly not without. It certainly hasn't always been an, an easy journey. But um, I think as a result, I'm a much happier individual doing following that course. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's interesting what you say though, isn't it? About um, uh, about the fear of the unknown, uh, and actually just how how comfortable we get with the familiar, even if actually the familiar is quite quite painful and something that we don't actually want. But but stepping outside of that of that place um, and and moving into a place that's you know that's un- unknown, I, I'm quite a passionate believer that we should all do something a little bit every day that that either scares us or that we've never done before just to be able to build that constant relationship with but actually it's okay it has been for for nearly every day so far it is okay and i think um society i'm, I'm not sure what post-covid society is going to look like but certainly society before was about was around conforming and i think it was it, it's an it's it is an easier pathway to conform because the rules are known and when you break away from that, there is a, there's always a degree of uncertainty and and unknown and um, fear of that unknown, but also sort of financial. You never know where your next meal is going to come from, at times, um, and you don't have that big support network of working for a big organisation with um, um, a structure around you which keeps you kind of keeps you cushioned and safe. Um, but I want, you know, I would hope that as a result of the experience of COVID, that people and pe- the fact that people have been working from home a lot more um, and, have, and have not been following that pathway, that repetitive pathway they they would normally do, that actually the, the, the opportunity to give them some clarity to realise actually, yeah, I could do it this way and it isn't, you know, it isn't quite, it isn't isn't bad at all. Mm. Well, in fact, it's better. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's one of those things, isn't it? It, it very often requires uh, change, either change through choice or change through circumstance for people to realise actually that, that they they that they can operate and be and exist in the world in a different way. And this is something that, that very definitely has caused change quite quickly. Uh, and because of the speed of it, then people get to compare, don't they? You know, the old with the new and possibly whatever's going to be the new new. So, so, so yeah, that is something that... Uh, uh, hopefully, will will encourage people to think about changing for the better. And it is it is easy to say, and I think it, but it's less easy to implement. But I think people should take this opportunity to to have a have a review of what makes them happy and how they have you know previously pre COVID what they were doing, what they actually want to do post COVID. I know that's easy to say, but um, it is a good good junction, a good opportunity to do just that. Mm. So thanks very much in, in, uh, in, indeed, Mark. So if people wanted to, uh, if people wanted to connect with, with, with WEM, with World Extreme Medicine, or, or you personally, how would, how would you advise people get in touch? Where do they go? Where do they find out about, about, about you, what you're up to, and, and about WEM? Um, I guess for WEM, it is, is typing in World Extreme Medicine. We pretty much come up first in any Google search, certainly for, for that search phrase. And then uh, I'm on LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, more than happy to connect with people and and, uh, and talk and chat and help them with their, you know, their aims and uh, aims and ambitions. So Mark Hannaford on LinkedIn and Facebook. Cool. Right. So Mark, thank you very much indeed. We kind of um, 
uh, draw to an end. So um, it has been an absolute, it's been a pleasure, it's been, it's been a joy actually to uh, to chat with you and to have a conversation about um, about the other bit, actually the big bit of your life that I'd, that I'd never actually ever had any exposure to in, in, in the times that our paths had crossed before. So um, I've really enjoyed our conversation, so thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me and love to be part of your podcast. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, no, no, thank you. Um, so um, thank you very much indeed. Mark has shared with you where you can, um, you know, where you can connect with him. And I certainly would encourage you to put the phrase World Extreme Medicine in into Google and just see the scale and the size of the amazing work that World Extreme Medicine is is doing. So my name is Ian Pitchford and I've been interviewing Mark Hannaford and this is Everyday People Living Inspirational Lives. <laughs>